Thank you for listening to this presentation. I know your time is valuable, so I won't waste it on long introductions, like those that begin when I was in grad school, or imagine yourself sitting in a classroom next to a giant iguana. And that's exactly what I'm doing right now, isn't it? Wasting your time on a long introduction. Never mind, here's my point. All you have to do is listen to the next sentence, and then you can go back to face tweeting. While knowledge of facts and the development of skills are central to any education, they do not constitute an education, because education is as much a matter of the heart as the head. Instilling in a student the willingness to learn and to go on learning is the central goal, one could argue the only goal, of educating a person. Invigorating curiosity for knowledge, ideally an obsessive curiosity bordering on fanaticism for new facts and ways of understanding, is as relevant as anything in the construction of meaningful learning. Seeding, nurturing, protecting the desire to learn, getting people excited about the possibility of gaining new insight, those should be our primary focus as educators. Or to look at it another way, showing students not just what we know, but why we love what we know, foregrounds and underlies every profitable moment in any classroom. Too often we are taught to see education as an intellectual journey, which it is, but it is as much, if not more, an emotional journey. True learning changes hearts, not just heads. Indeed, after you've had a real education, you're never the same again. That is the goal. So, how do we do that? With the easy stuff, no problem. Throw it out there, they gobble it up, they love it, they learn, huzzah! <sighs> if only. The real challenge for teachers is how to take complex, remote, utterly intractable tangles of data and cook them down into an obsession. Now, this is where I'm going to give you my advice from 40 years of fighting that good fight, and here it is. When you're facing a difficult class, when you're presenting complicated, abstruse material, my advice is lie, pretend, assume every student wants to learn what you're teaching with the earnest hope that your genteel prevarication will become for some of your students a reality. Maintaining and insisting on that canard, giving students no recourse to complacency or ennui, acting as if they may not like it now but they will grow to love this stuff you're talking about as much as you do, stifles any reflex towards not connecting with the material. Isn't this amazing? Now don't fall out of your chair, but wait till you see what happens next. I bet you never thought you'd hear something like what I'm about to say, but hold on, here it comes. Those sorts of, um, distortions create an environment which feeds the reality of engagement. Let's be real. You were there once. You were a student induced into joining somebody's passion for a subject. Someone somehow made you want to stretch your mind, push your limits, and now you're on the other side. You're the one inducing and stretching and pushing. Remember who you were then, and you'll know who you should be now. Now, I just heard this on the radio, NPR, which means it must be true. There was a study that showed when patients feel an emotional attachment to their doctors, there's a higher correlation with successful medical treatment. In other words, Patients are more likely to take their meds or follow a diet if they like and trust their doctor, if they feel an emotional attachment. Now, you're a doctor of something, or at least a master. Be the kind of caregiver that patients like and trust and want to work with. Build an emotional connection. Be a heart doctor. <laughs> oh my God, that was so corny. Please forget I said that. Here's some more, possibly better, advice. One of the most important things teachers can do is learn. Yeah, 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 that's a cliché. But it's a cliché because it's so spectacularly right. And I don't mean learn from your students. Cute, yeah, fine, do it. But that's too easy. I mean really learn. Sign up for some class, some hard class. Remind yourself what it's like to inhale the hot breath of imminent flunkitude. 
feel lost. Give everything you've got to get the right answer, and still you get it wrong. Remind yourself how much you hate and fear the color red. See again how low your self-esteem can go. Become an undergraduate. If that pain doesn't make you a kinder teacher, you should probably go into politics. I did. Not politics. I mean, I've thrown myself several times into the icy pool of learning tough stuff. One year when I was on sabbatical, I took a series of courses in Biblical Hebrew, thinking, Ah, this is just another ancient language I already read to. Stripped me of all pride. That Hebrew train mowed me down. So a few years later, I tried Sanskrit, the ancient language of India. Three times I have started it, still haven't made it to the end of the book. Humbling? <laughs> That's an understatement. But those failures have made me a much better teacher. Because when I can't understand why Latin endings are so hard for my students to learn, I mean, doesn't everyone know them? Please, I knew Latin endings before I ever had my first date. And that's the problem, isn't it? I can't remember the pain of what the heck is hick hike hawk Hebrew drove deep into my entrails the hot sword of first immersion. Then Sanskrit salted the wound. Remembering what it is to be that student. The good, earnest, hard-working, but struggling, cramming on the bus desperado for knowledge or just a lucky right answer because that works too. Remembering the view from the other side of the test made me rethink a lot of what I was doing as a teacher, which was mostly what had been done to me, and much of which I came to realize was pointless pain. From that, I midwifed two thoughts. First, the most beautiful word in the English language is bonus, as in bonus credit. Second, why can't students show that they understand something after the test if that's when they learned it? The struggling student in me kept saying, Yes, I flunked that stupid test, but in the process I learned the material I was supposed to learn. Look at me now, I know it. Please, teacher, give me back some of the credit you took away. Come on, it's not like there's a limited number of points floating out there in the test verse. Points are not like water in the West. They don't have to be allocated carefully. Okay, I blew my first chance, but isn't the point that I now know the stuff you asked me to know? How is that not learning? With such desperation in mind, and in the wake of an extremely difficult Hebrew quiz, I began to think about restructuring the way I as a teacher apportioned grades. Shouldn't it be more like economics, like money? Do work, get paid. Show learning, get points. What else are tests about? Think of it this way. If a student knows half the material on the test, why isn't that 50 points of credit Yes, out of a possible hundred, and nobody's going to be pinning ribbons or throwing parades for that. But the student's smarter now, huh? Why isn't that money in the bank? At least a little money. Why is it instead some black mark on the student's record? Why is 50 out of a 100 considered a loss? Nothing was lost. The only way to lose here is, well, actually, there's no way to lose here. Because the student entered dumb and now he's not, or at least not as dumb. If learning is money, pay up, even if it is sub-minimum wage. So the desperate Hebrew student in me convinced the snotty-ass Latin teacher to start rethinking grade structures in my classes. Selective classes. In those where that change worked, I created a system where students who did work earned points. Do the work, earn 800 points, you get a B. Earn 900 points, an A. Earn a thousand, a free trip to the counseling center because you already have an A. You don't need a higher A, you need a life. For subjects that require a more rigid grading structure, like languages, where learning things late in the term will not work, I started looking for places where I could at least add bonus work. Bonus, that beautiful word. Here was my thinking. Okay, little student, you clearly didn't learn this thing I asked you to learn before you took the test. But you say you know it now. Fine. Show me. Do this bonus drill, and I'll give you back some of the points you could have earned on the test. Well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with giving people a little space to learn things on their own time, in their own way? I'll tell you what's wrong with that. It's exhausting! 
It means you as a teacher have to make accommodations for every student's individual needs. Within reason, you're giving them the freedom to work at their own pace. Heavens to Betsy isn't teaching tough enough. But think about it. What is teaching about? Who's it for? Not you. If you're doing your job, it's about them. My struggles with Hebrew and Sanskrit reminded me about the exact nature of this ordeal, where the primary battle was to force square facts into my very, very round brain. And it was obvious the exact engineering of that task requires close attention to details which may pertain to me as the type of learner that I am, and maybe to a few other students in the class, but not everyone. And that's just the way it is. What? I'm supposed to accommodate every individual student's particular needs and schedule? Please, no way. But I also realized that it's possible to forge a system which has some give in the schedule, a little leeway in the grading, particularly for those students who are struggling harder with some part of the class, because for some reason this is harder for them than for the others. When providing flexibility is feasible, where's the loss? As a teacher, I see only profit. To judge from student comments on evaluations, they love to be graded this way. They claim it makes them work harder. Uh-huh, right. And according to them, I'm going straight to heaven, but I'm here to tell you that's still up in the air. What really matters from my experience is that even those students who get a 50 on the test, with this grading system, most of them don't see it as a failing grade but 50 points they didn't have before. So they come and ask me how to get another 50 points. And I say, let's talk about doing a bonus drill. Or better, how you can do better on the next test. See all these points you can still earn? A good grade is well within reach. And they leave what could be otherwise a depressing and possibly education-ending experience motivated to learn more and better. Positive emotions, fuel their intellect, and build their curiosity. Ah, you say, but what about the good students, the ones who ace every test, who turn in perfect papers, who buy the textbook, who open it? Well, what's wrong with letting them show you what they know, which is a lot? And once they do saying, you know a lot, here's an A. How is that compromising anything? What I find is that the good ones will quickly learn to love the course material and even more love being rewarded for knowing it. So they want to keep on learning and earning credit. How hard is it then to encourage them to go off and keep learning after the class is done? And isn't that the point? To inspire more learning beyond the classroom? No, in my experience, you don't have to worry about the good students. Only foster their passion for education. In the last decade or so, I've slowly and uncomfortably embraced the world of online classes. Not because it's natural to me, I'm a classicist. I'd still be happy with papyrus and a pointer. But Socrates is dead, and this is no longer his world. Which is probably all for the good considering how he ended. Here, drink this. <laughs> Talk about being denied tenure. All the same, much of what worked for him has worked for me too. I grew up in the South in an age when the only things electronic in the classroom were a clock and a fan that was always pointed at the teacher. But for all the technology has evolved in the modern age, we haven't. Not that I can see. Humans are still the same as Socrates' pupils. Emotional, needy, sometimes eager to learn, but just as often grumpy and incommunicado. The only real difference between our distant past and this new distant present is that now we're all electrons to each other. Two-dimensional, recorded, available 24-7, little TV shows made on even littler budgets. As I found myself stumbling into this new world of flat classes, the question for me is how to reproduce not just the intellectual and academic aspects of good teaching, but the emotional engagement I've spent so much effort building into my 3D classes. Importing improved grading structures that focus on achievement and provide a credit for learning economy? No problem. But what about the need to reach out and enthuse, to stare down a straggler and build the excitement that makes good teaching work? In my conventional face-to-face -face classes, 
I do that mainly by talking with students be it through lectures, or in seminars, or at office hours, some sort of live performance of my engagement with the material delivered in person, on the spot, in the presence of the subject at hand. You'll be shocked to learn that my teaching has a lot of theater in it. So the way I see it is, how do I produce a quality show, share the same passion I can on the classroom stage when it looks like I'm being delivered by Amazon? I can easily make a lecture I give face-to-face -face seem heartfelt and spontaneous, when to be honest, the reality is I'm sometimes thinking about picking up my dry cleaning. Come on, admit it. Everyone knows the difference between a live concert and a recording. How do I wrap up and package for digital distribution the feeling of spontaneity? What makes a live lecture seem personal, special, made for you and only you today, straight from the heart? That's what makes the best lectures emotionally compelling. How do I do that when I look like I've been folded in bubble wrap? Taping a live show, uh, lecture, I mean, is one way, but that has its drawbacks. Every error, which in a live show is forgivable and even fun, when it ends up being replayed a thousand times, and the listener knows it, it just begins to look ragged and begs the question, why didn't you go back and fix that? And if you're fixing that, why not go back and fix everything, which is time-consuming. Now, I'm lucky enough to have a position here at Utah State where spending that sort of time creating new course materials is valued and rewarded. So I've had the chance to spend the many hours required in planning and perfecting the best presentations I can for my online classes. And my students attest over and over to the usefulness of these recordings, but the sheer volume of lifeblood I've poured into these, both making and updating them, is very high. I can't recommend that for everyone. Nor can or do these alone build engagement. Indeed, the opposite. They often impose impediments to that all-important, vital element in teaching, the student's emotional engagement with their education. Put simply, no matter how good canned presentations are, they don't feel special. They don't give the sense that I care about each of the individuals viewing or listening to them, or that it even matters to me that they're learning. Without that personal element, it's hard to build a feeling of heartfelt engagement, and no emotion fetters the emotional experience. Lately, however, I've happened upon one way of communicating better my interest in the progress of each individual online student. It has to do with what is often the most critical moment for many of them, when they take a test and then receive a score. At that juncture, when they're facing assessment, their emotional attachment to the material is often at its highest, and targeting those moments I've discovered can be something useful in the learning process. In my face-to-face -face classes, I can give students a lot of feedback through the term, both positive reinforcement and corrective explication. We often talk in person, face to face, about issues and answers. In that context, there's no way students can escape the sense that I care about their learning, and thus so should they. But it's much harder to do that when everything's delivered in prepackaged lectures and testing is administered on some teaching platform that spray paints incorrect in primary red across any flaw in their work. There, what stands out is punishment which undermines any attempt to reward students for what they've actually learned, even if it's not that much. After they flunk a test, feeling good about the class is not my struggling student's usual response. Instead, we're back to the old style of focusing on what's wrong, what got deducted, not the progress that's been made. What I've discovered is that I can recover online at least some of the good things that naturally happen in my face-to-face -face classes if I carefully hand-grade tests. I realized when I said that most of you just shut down and stopped listening. And I get it. Grading is bad enough without making it longer and more onerous. Carefully curated, detailed hand grading is a heavy load to ask anyone to bear. But online, I found it pays huge dividends. When I go through students' tests and not only remark on what they missed and how to fix problems, but also comment on what they did right and how to keep doing it right, students I find are much more likely to develop a special bond with me and the material.
I've learned to note the problems and triumphs each individual student experiences and to keep records of them. To be honest, not that many. So I can refer back to particular details on the next test. That gives the impression I'm carefully monitoring a student's progress out of great concern for their success in the class. Please note I said impression. The upshot is that when I praise them for the progress they're making, most students believe me, and that belief sometimes turns into actual progress. Much of the time, my comment is nothing more than, good job here, or I can tell you studied hard for this part of the test. And maybe they did, and maybe they didn't, but either way, they're more likely to study hard for the next test because they think, I think, they're a good learner. That builds emotional engagement with the course. Such positive feedback to students on tests coordinates well with other opportunities for them to show their good habits, or at least the prospective will to have some one day. To that end, I've built many short bonus exercises, essentially homework drills, that reinforce learning things early in the term so the student has time to relearn material, which is when the true learning begins. So, the lesson is, in any teaching environment, but the more remote, the more significant it becomes, one, break the learning into small steps that deliver immediate rewards in the form of hard-earned credit. And two, give at least as much positive, i.e. supportive, feedback as negative, corrective feedback. That way students feel you're on their side that you have confidence in their ability and willingness to learn. If you show that confidence, there's a much better chance they will too. To conclude this presentation, and whether I'm speaking or not, those are always my favorite four words. Emotional attachment to course material does not just lie at the heart of teaching. It is the heart of teaching. It fuels the life of everything good that happens in the classroom and after. Thus, instruction at its best is a matter of changing heads and hearts. And when done right, more often than not, it hurts. If you don't remember that in your own education, try Sanskrit. So, build into your courses measures for countering that pain and bolstering confidence, for rewarding and gladdening as much as possible every step the student takes toward progress and achievement. Keep your standards high, but make each step doable. Above all, show you care. And don't forget that the most important word in all of pedagogy is bonus. It's the Latin word for good. Sit bonus. That means let there be good. Thank you for listening. Just for doing that, I'll add two points to your final grade total. See? Now you feel bonus.